Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Greenwood, Tulsa, chronicling the catalyst of the destruction of Black Wall Street. My name is Angeline Fraser Giles, and I am the executive director of the National Network for Justice. NNJ supports and strengthens state based organizations seeking to reduce jail, prison, and detention populations. We are aware that race plays a huge role in the criminal justice system, and we wanted to host this discussion tonight in that vein. In 2019, I suggested to our board that we hold our annual meeting in Tulsa in 2021 as the community there would be commemorating the 100th year of the massacre. However, we are living in a different time. So considering the COVID pandemic, we bring our members and supporters and our, and our supporters this program virtually. I am pleased tonight to have three guests who will help us explore the history and culture of Greenwood Tulsa. First is Michelle Place, who began working as the business manager for the Tulsa Historical Society and Museum in 20, 2001 and was named executive director in 2012. She's a two-time Emmy winning documentary writer, technical advisor, and producer for Boomtown, An American Journey, and Lador Vidor, Generation to Generation, Tulsa's Jewish Community. In 2018, she was named as one of 35 Global Women Drivers for Peace. Michelle is a member of the Rotary Club of Tulsa, the DAR, Women in Communications, and the Boston Avenue Church where she sings in the chancel choir. Michelle is a native of Little Rock and has lived in Tulsa for 34 years. Our next guest is James Cavan Ross. He is a connoisseur of all things Black Wall Street of America. Since his return from Houston, Texas over two decades ago, Mr. Ross hit the ground running in the quest of researching the hidden and untapped history of Tulsans of the Greenwood community. Inspired by the works of Dr. John Hope Franklin, a native Tulsan and world renowned author and historian, Ross has been researching the history and culture of his hometown. Following in the footsteps of his father, retired state representative Don Ross, Cavan is very active in his community of North Tulsa. He was featured in the documentary Hate Crimes in the Heartland and is chair of the Tulsa Race Massacre Graves Search Committee. Hannibal Johnson is an attorney, author, and independent consultant specializing in diversity and inclusion, cultural competence issues, and nonprofit governance. Mr. Johnson has also served as an adjunct professor at the University of Tulsa College of Law, Oklahoma State University, and the University of Oklahoma. Mr. Johnson serves on the federal 400 Years of African American History Commission, a body charged with planning, developing, and implementing activities appropriate to the 400th anniversary of the arrival in 1619 of Africans in the English colonies at Point Comfort, Virginia. He also chairs the Education Committee for the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. He is a graduate of Harvard Law School and did his undergraduate work at the University of Arkansas. He is also the author of numerous books, including his most recent, Black Wall Street 100, An American City Grapples with Its Historical Racial Trauma. So thank you all for joining us today. And we're gonna go ahead and get, and get started with Michelle. I want you to just tell me a little bit about what brought you to this work. Uh, and then we'll go into a little bit of the history of Tulsa and Greenwood. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, I am truly honored to be a part of this discussion and uh, not only to tell part of its story, but to um, share it um, widely. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, over the last few years, I guess I've come to understand that I might not be normal. I might not have had the um, uh, 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 the raising of many of my uh, contemporaries. Uh, as Angeline stated before, I am from Little Rock. As a point of disclosure, I was born September of 1957. My aunt was a student at Little Rock Central High School during the integration, um, the Little Rock Nine as it's commonly referred to. Uh, 
My father had graduated from that high school a few years before. Um, I uh, grew up in, in Little Rock, uh, going to um, the First Baptist Church where Governor Faubus, who participated in that, sat on the other end of the pew from where my family traditionally sat. So from a very young age, I certainly knew about him. All of this is to say that from the very beginning of uh, my life, I was exposed to the story of integration in one way. My father also worked for all of the coll smaller colleges in the state of Arkansas in their athletic programs. And so um, as a child, although I'm not sure how much I was really aware of it, but that he was up close and personal with integration through college athletics. Then when I was in the ninth grade, I was one of those who was bused um, about uh, 12 miles from my home when the junior high that I dreamed of going to was at the end of my street. Um, and so I'm bused 12 miles leaving at seven o'clock every morning and, and getting um, at whatever. Um, I came from um, public schools, predominantly white. We had two African-American students in my junior high. And so it was a whole awakening and merging of two very diverse cultures where we had to um, figure out everything um, from, there were three junior highs that merged and we had three duly elected student council presidents. So how were we going to decide who was going to get to be a president? What kind of music would the bands play? Um, I mean, just everything from the style of cheerleading. One of my guy friends from high school told me that the boys were able to settle racial differences or to merge, if you will, on the athletic fields. Well, this was a time before Title IX, and so there were no girl sports at the time. So we didn't have the chance um, to have that same kind of experience that the, the guys did. Um, still, my, my aunt is having a very big influence on my life. Um, even to this day, she is driven um, to work in race relations because in her mind, she did not do enough for the Little Rock Nine. Um, so that's the scene that I come out of. I, I moved to Tulsa and I had been here 15 years before I ever heard an inkling about what had happened in 1921. Um, I had just come to work for the Historical Society, unbeknownst to me that the 1997 commission report, which Kevin's father was so much a part of, um, had just been released. And so the phone is ringing, um, particularly the first call that I got, it was a reporter from New Zealand who wanted to know about the 1921 riot. In, or, or he didn't say the 1921, he just said the Tulsa race riot. Well, my mind immediately went to 1968 because that was my frame of reference. And so I hung up the phone. I told him I want to find out the best person for him to talk to, hung up the phone, turned to the only other employee of the Tulsa Historical Society at the time, who was a retired news anchor. And he said, you don't know, do you? And I was, I said, I don't think so. And so um, this executive director then explained to me what had happened in 1921. And the biggest shock was why, why didn't anyone talk about this? Why is this news? Why are people just finding out? Because remember my, um, my frame of reference is we always talked about Little Rock and what happened in 1957. I mean, even outside of my family, um, I dare say that most people in Little Rock knew about 1957 and the Little Rock Nine. So that was my start. And um, it, because of the influence of my grandparents and my beloved Annie Sue particularly, uh, do I have this desire to work in race relations and tell the story.
Thank you very much. I sure. remember having a conversation with you when we started talking about this and I was I was just struck by, you know, someone actually had a connection to Little Rock 9, oh. uh, your aunt okay. and having gone to the to that to that high school. Mm -hmm. And so when you found out this history, immediately what did you what what were you thinking? What did you do? Did you were you trying to gain more information? What did you what did you think about it? Um it Yes, indeed. But um, at the time, the Tulsa Historical Society was trying to build our permanent museum. So that that really was taking up most of my energy and focus in, in my work life. But I still have an ear to the ground. And but my experience in Tulsa was predominantly in the white community let's call it south of the tracks, just for um, a, a descriptive way. And um, the thing that I was hearing from white Tulsa was that, why do we have to talk about this? That was a bad part of our history. I mean, I believe our institution at the time was focused on telling the story of Tulsa as the oil capital of the world and uh, promoting our beautiful Art Deco buildings and all. And um, that was bad history. Why do you wanna talk about it? And so it was not until I became uh, the executive director in 2012, uh, we had a staff who was like-minded and we um, agreed together that we were going to tell all of Tulsa stories, not just the rich white oil story. And um, we knew that um, minorities traditionally don't go to majorities with their history, with their artifacts, with um, their stories. And it, that's certainly understandable. And so I knew that if I wanted that to happen, it was up to me that minority communities were not coming to my door, I had to go to theirs. And so I just began showing up in Greenwood at public events or lectures and was determined to build relationships and trust. Mm -hmm. And little did I know the impact um, that it would have on me personally, on this institution, um, and the friendships uh, that my life was so much better um, for having made that choice. But it was a very conscious choice that I made. Yeah. And I think for all of us, it's a very conscious choice to try to learn more. Because I know when I first um, heard about it, because we didn't learn about this in school, right? I grew up right. in Brooklyn, and then I went to Catholic school, and then I moved to the West Coast. And even on the West Coast, in Nevada, we didn't learn about this. And, and it probably wasn't even in college when I learned. It was probably more recent uh, that I just started to learn more about, about Greenwood. So I appreciate, I appreciate that. One of the things that we talked about is just your knowledge of the history of the area. So could you talk a little bit about just the history? I mean, it's oil, it was oil, right? But during the, in the 1800s, there were other things that were happening. Yeah. Also. Yeah, I, so I talk think, a little bit about that. Well, um, so we've already acknowledged the fact that I'm not from Oklahoma, that I'm from Arkansas. Um, and so what if people think they know Oklahoma history, they may have heard of the land run. And it really was only after I began working at the Tulsa Historical Society and had been here for 15 years that there was an awakening for me and understanding that there are really two very diverse Oklahomas still to this day. Um, it's the Western half, which was called Oklahoma Territory. Um, and it is much more arid, uh, flat, rolling plains uh, with a whole different uh, type of Native American indigenous population, the uh, Cheyenne, the Sioux, Apache, those who really uh, roamed far um, following the buffalo herds. The eastern half of Oklahoma is much different, not only our topography, which is uh, hilly, where the foothills of the Ozarks were known as green country, 
um, lots of lakes and rivers and um, forest and didn't have buffalo um, that were roaming through. So in the early 1800s, and I think you have to start with the Louisiana Purchase, so Thomas Jefferson there and moving on to Andrew Jackson when he was president and this idea of um, white supremacy certainly taking hold uh, and the wanting to remove the indigenous population out of the Southeastern United States. Uh, what affects Oklahoma ultimately are the five civilized tribes, Creek, Cherokee, Choctaw, uh, Seminole and uh, Chickasaw. I got them all, didn't I, Hannah? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, who were in the Southeastern United States. And so um, they, uh, Europeans, white Europeans wanted that land, those plantations, that agricultural way of life. And so they needed to move these indigenous peoples who lived in permanent homes. Uh, one of the things is you cannot paint with a broad paintbrush within each of those tribes, it's very different. And even within the individual tribe, it's um, very um, different. So we have different treaties, et cetera. Ultimately, the idea was Andrew Jackson to move those populations to Indian territory. And so through the early uh, 1800s, we see a constant refiguring of those boundaries as each of those tribes were moved. Now there was great dissension within the tribes. Um, some of them saw the handwriting on the wall of European domination. And um, within the tribes, there would have been individual clans, villages who came before the forced removal. Um, but certainly with the removal, what you need to understand is those five tribes were all slavers. They had slaves, not only of African descent, but some of their slaves were also European, you know, whether they had captured them in battle or, or however, but anyway, predominantly African slaves um, came with them. And this becomes very problematic with the Civil War and with emancipation. And it is still affecting Oklahoma today. What happened because of the treaties, and again, you can't treat, you don't paint with that broad brush, some of the slaves um, were seen as members of the tribes, but in other, some tribes, they were not. And then the United States government did not see them as American citizens. So you have a number of people who are more or less in a no man's land. They're not Native American and they're not considered U.S. citizens. So it takes a number of, of treaties and all. And, and I like to say that the past causes the present and affects the future. And that's certainly the story today. Another difference between Indian Territory and Oklahoma Territory is the division of land. With Andrew Jackson, there was this overall idea in, um, I'm, I'm sorry, um, moving up after the Civil War with the Dawes Act, and it's this idea of dividing up the land. So Oklahoma Territory had the land runs of 1889, 1891, but in Indian Territory, it was divided by the allotment system. Again, each tribe is treated differently. It's in some tribes, the head of household would have gotten 160 acres, uh, a non-married, um, over the age of 18 might have gotten 80, and then a under 18 might have gotten 60 acres. Or um, some tribes, depending on the value of the land, if it was suitable for farming and had water, um, then you would have gotten fewer acres. If the land was on a rocky hillside, you may have gotten less acres. And so it's problematic that also that these allotments may or may not have been adjoining. Um, so the children's land may be miles and miles and miles away. But what also comes with this allotment is taxes that has okay. to be paid on the land. So you can imagine native peoples who have not dealt in cash, but have bartered for hundreds of years and traded, 
don't really understand the value of a dollar and easy, you can see how they would have been easily cheated out of their land. Oh, we'll give you a silver dollar for your child's allotment, which happens to be 40, 50 miles away. Um, it might have seemed like a good offer. And so therefore they're ultimately cheated out of their land. And then as you move into the early 1900s with the discovery of oil, and we begin to have an in, more of an influx of not only um, more African-Americans who are past emancipation, seeking prosperity, peace, the rise of black towns in Oklahoma, but we have more white um, of European descent coming into the area wanting to make their fortunes in the oil field. So once again, it's a clash of cultures and it always comes back to land ownership because that's how we have wealth that can then be passed down to our future uh, generations. generations. And, and that's where so, we are right now. And that's where we are that's right now. We are right and again, now. The past causes the present and affects the future. So yeah. that's uh, Oklahoma's history is very complicated. I haven't done it justice. Uh, it deserves scholarly programs on its own, but yeah. there's sort of an overview. Yeah, no, it's a great overview and I, I appreciate that. And, and in talking about, about uh, building wealth and being able to pass that on from generation to generation, that's where we are right now in this full discussion. And we'll probably get to some of that uh, in terms of reparations, like what does that mean, right? What does that mean for us as the broader community, not just in Oklahoma, but, but overall in these United States? Um, so I'm gonna move to Kevin. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you kind of the same question, how you got involved. We know that your, um, your father was very involved and, and you study the history and you um, also, you know, like one of my uh, former, I don't know, I wouldn't call him a mentor because I never got to meet him. I actually saw him in a restaurant once in DC, but I've done a lot of reading of mm. John Hope Franklin. So could you talk a little bit about how you got involved and, and why this is so important to you? Oh my gosh, it's a book all by itself. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, <laughs> I'm reminded, uh, I was in, in Houston, Texas uh, in the uh, early 90s, kind of homesick. I had my baby brother who passed away and I was feeling kind of homesick. And, and so I was looking for an excuse to come back home. And it wasn't for uh, watching a PBS program, a friend of mine called, they talking about your hometown. And uh, I went uh, to turn to the channel and was going back to Tea Time, which recently aired during Black History Month on PBS. And as I listened to the stories, I said, I know everybody that's in this video. I know them all. And so after, you know, just being inspired by the video, I called my parents up and said, I finally made my decision. I'm coming home. And, and it was been a blessing uh, ever since. And so I was... I was working on a program at the Green Culture Center where I was teaching kids a uh, videography. Uh, that was my work in, in Houston, Texas, working in a number of television stations. And I had my little film crew with me. So Dr. John Hope Franklin was coming to the Rusia Library. And so uh, uh, as he gave his presentation, I uh, went to raise my hand and, uh, and, and was hoping that, um, that Dr. Franklin would, uh, uh, would acknowledge me and he went right over and answered somebody else about two, three different times. And then I just stopped and I just sat down and then it was a lady that was behind me that said, Dr. Frank, this man, will I have a question for you? And basically uh, he called on me, he said, he should have spoke up. And, <laughs> and so when I did speak up uh, and I told him uh, I was inspired to come back home based on seeing him on television and it's been a blessing ever since. And so I'm kind of tickled to death. His nephew, the late Waddle Jones, had motioned me to stay uh, past the program to talk with Dr. Franklin. And so he asked me, he said, what is your name? I said, my name is Kevin Ross. He said, Kevin Ross, who's your daddy? And I said, uh, uh, State Representative Don Ross. He said, State Don Ross is your daddy? I said, yes, sir. Boy, I know who you are. I've been knowing you ever since you were five years old. 
And that right there began a lovely relationship that I had with Dr. Franklin uh, that lasted until the day that he died. Um, well, luckily he, he didn't me. say I've known you since a baby and I changed your diapers because that's what people <laughs> Right. Oh, oh, uh, well, it goes back even further. It goes further. That's it. You know, after we got, uh, uh, we became very close and I start uh, doing some projects. One of my projects was to rename a street to go down Greenwood that was formerly Haskell Street and rename it to John Hope Franklin. And, and, uh, and I was also inspired. I, I just, you know, I had to find out who Haskell was. I was just like, we need a different change in it. And I said, if you mind, I would love for you to be my adopted grandfather. And he turned around and said, grandfather, I can be your daddy. And so those who know Dr. Frank, he has a, a great sense of humor. And so um, he and I would talk numerous times. Um, uh, and he would tell me about the things I'm going to show you and, 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 uh, and tell you about. Um, and I like your interest in history. And I want you to do this favor. That's what I've been trying to do. And he said, I want you, as other people are learning about what happened in Tulsa, I want to challenge you to make all Tulsans historians to help tell the story, including the young and people of, of different, uh, different uh, uh, ethnicities. And so I fulfilled that and continued to work in that era. Uh, one magical moment with Dr. Franklin was... Uh, uh, he and I went to lunch when he came to Tulsa. He, he visited Tulsa numerous times. And um, we were having lunch downtown. And he said, so manufacturedly, he said, well, you know, I'll be riding on Air Force One to California where the president mm -hmm. will announce me as the chairman of the president's initiative on race relations. And I'm like, what? So I'm writing stuff down. Like, oh my God, he said, wait a minute, what are you doing? I said, this is front page news. I get to get this out. I said, no, no, I don't want you to tell nobody. I'm just sharing that with you. And I like child, you know, I'm bad at keeping secrets. And they, <laughs> I went on to my father and, and the state representative, uh, uh, I mean, Senator Maxine Horner and Roger Randall, who was the president and my boss at the, uh, then it was University Center of Tulsa, then it turns to Rogers University. And now we know today as OSU Tulsa, which also is the formal grounds of the, original Booker T. Washington High School there in the Greenwood District. And so, uh, and so when, and this is also during the same period that I was pushing the effort to, uh, to have the city to rename Haskell Street into the John Hope Franklin Boulevard. And I was like on pins and needles at that point in time. So I'm so glad on June 19th of that year, I believe it's 1997, made it official. Uh, a month early, he was uh, uh, one of the distinguished authors on the uh, Peggy Helmrich uh, Distinguished Author Award. And then, of course, he ended up uh, uh, going to California with President Clinton uh, to receive that honors being the, the, the chairman of race relations. And so things uh, start picking up, you know, uh, uh, there in the Greenwood area. And I just start documenting, not only just documenting what was going on in Greenwood, but also be a part of the changes and help the change to go along. Cause I knew the air was going to uh, grow and especially with all the, the attention uh, that Tussle was getting. Um, I was honored to uh, videotape the survivors uh, for the Tussle, uh, for the uh, Oklahoma Commission to study the Tussle race right of 1921 um, and, and videotape along, you know, I was assisting commissioner Eddie Faye Gates and, and we would go to the house, they would come and meet with us and hear them to tell the stories at age five, nine, 13, 19 years of age. I think we cleared about over a hundred of them. Uh, so, of those, but, Kevin, uh, let me stop uh, you there. Let me stop you there really quickly. Let me stop you really quickly because you talk mm -hmm. about the, um, the survivors, right? Who are up in age now, I would imagine. Yes. This happened in, in 1921 and, and some of these uh, mm -hmm. folks who you were interviewing were five at the time, nine, nine at the time. So what are some of the things that they expressed to you in terms of what they were going through and what they were experience, experiencing as at these, this young age? At the mindset of five years old, we basically uh, woke up a sleeping giant because they had 
basically never told their stories to anyone, not even their own family members. And so as a child, they just quietly just tuck it away. And here we come asking all these questions, which regurgitated all these memories. So like uh, one star uh, media star that really took off and that was uh, uh, Eldoris McCondishy. Uh, uh, she, you know, she would tell a story what she remembered, then we had to go back out because she remembered something else. And she talked, one of her stories, she talked about how the mob had, the white mob had uh, went into a, uh, the family church and tried to set the church afire. We lost Kevin's feed. <laughs> so, wait a okay, here wait he, he comes back. Wait a minute, I knew this was gonna happen, so I backed up. <laughs> okay. There you are. Okay. So, uh, Eldors would tell a story about the church and how, wait a minute, let me turn, I'm getting an echo here in my part. The rioters were trying to to set the place afire, and and it will it will rear up and then it would go out. It will it set it again, and the fire would just go out. So the later on, the uh, uh, the story goes that for years that the preacher would not have that wall painted over. They just left it as a reminder of what happened. Uh, during that time, in subsequent years, uh, new leadership they went on and paint over uh, that uh, paint over that that mar uh, of the area. I'm always reminded of and you probably heard the stories George Monroe, whose uh, family home was near Mount Zion Church, uh, there, which is uh, uh, right in the parking lot of OSU Tulsa, is where his family home was, including uh, his father's. Uh, uh, Roller rink. He had a, a, a roller uh, roller blade rink, and uh, which is also destroyed uh, during the time of the riot. But he remembered and recalled at five years old, as the mobsters came into their home and set the curtains afire. He and his sister hid underneath the bed, and as the mobster would enter the room and and set the room afire. The mobster foot stood on his hand. He was about to yell out until his sister put his hand, put her hand over his mouth to keep him yelling because had he yelled out, they would have been dead as well. Um, it's so many stories. It's like trying to figure out your, your, uh, your, your favorite child, uh, Otis uh, Clark, uh, who was about 18 or 19 years of age. Uh, he, he had the most descriptive stories Matter of fact, he would talk about how he uh, was with uh, uh, Sam Jackson, who owned the funeral home, Jack's Memory Chapel, and how he was trying to get, he just bought a brand new ambulance, and they were trying to get the ambulance out of the car, out of the garage, and, uh, and as he would open up the door, uh, 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 a bullet rang out and struck him in the hand, and they took off running. And so subsequently, that ambulance was destroyed. Uh, it's so many stories, it's so rich in this history, because here's a group of people, including Dr. John Ho Franklin. When these folks talk, this is talk before the internet, before television, and possibly right up around the time of radio. And these folks spoke with such descriptive uh, 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 color of, of, a, such a, of, a, of a situation as, as if you were right there. And they were the ability to tell those stories is just so magical and it would intrigue me. And even it was times where I would uh, uh, not be filming, oh, we'll just go uh, out to eat. Or uh, many times like Kenny Booker and my aunt, my great aunt Mildred Evett, uh, she, uh, uh, we will go fishing. And then again, I'm like a spoiled kid, got these two elders telling me all of the things that went on when they were my age and older and just talking about like life was. I was spoiled rotten to be around them and I miss them so. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure the stories are absolutely amazing, more so than what we've okay. been able to, that what we've been able to see, you know, in various documentaries and in reading and books and things like that. 
Um, I'm curious because you're on the you're the chair uh, the chair of the Tulsa Race Massacre Grave Search Committee. Could you yes. talk a little bit about what is where is the site actually where there's this grave and what is happening now? Well, mind you, we are charged with the mission to search numerous uh, areas rumored to be uh, mass graves through around the city. Uh, the one particular that we are focusing on right now is that at Oakland Cemetery, uh, which is on Route 66 on 11th Street in Peoria here in Tulsa. Uh, just a stone throw uh, from downtown Tulsa. Um, we had started on a task meet with the mayor, me, myself, along with Senator, the late Senator Horner and a number of other community activists to talk about doing something that no other city has done. And of course, the city of Tulsa has yet to do. And that was to put up a search, make a good effort to look for those who lost their lives in, in, uh, uh, in Tulsa in 1921. We heard and read all the information from the Race Ride Commission report. And uh, shockingly, we heard from other people where at the last minute, back, I believe it was 1998, 1999, when there was uh, excavation to begin at that time, and at the last minute was called off. And it was a promise that we'll come back and we'll deal with the issue of the mass graves. That was 1999 and, and 1998, and nothing had happened until 2018 when a, uh, a front page story in the Washington Post uh, basically talked, did an expose about the mass graves, which also uh, hopefully inspired our mayor, uh, uh, G.T. Bynum, to uh, uh, cause a, uh, uh, an investigation of it. And so that was 2018 that, that the discussion began. And I must say, uh, uh, I'm kind of partial with our current mayor because I call him a hero and historic because he is the first mayor in the city of Tulsa in a hundred years that is dealing with the mass grave issue. Now, back in July, uh, in the heat of the summer, we uh, uh, began excavation there at Oakland. Uh, it, that site was called a Sexton site. And we did, we dug for uh, three enormous trenches. We went 15 feet down into the ground till we hit water and, and found other things other than bones. We found old shoes, uh, purses, a coin box that contained uh, 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 $2 bills and some quarters dating back to the turn of the century. Uh, horseshoes, all these were found, but yet we did not find any bodies in that particular site. <clears throat> So we uh, reconvene in October. And this is all with the understanding of we didn't have no documentation, even though this was a city owned, seed and controlled uh, cemetery, we didn't have no documentation exactly where they were. But we do know the documentation that we did have that the city paid for a funeral of those who were killed, possibly 18. Uh, when we uh, began in October to dig, we did find at least 12 in one trench. They were laid out as like they were dominoes in the case. Also in that trench was like some stairs. So it led our research to believe that there might be even more coffins underneath uh, the ones that we can see on top. So we let were, me ask you, because you said that they were laid out like, like dominoes. Were they in fact I mean, when we th think massacre, um, I think of just bodies being put in, you know, in, in a large grave pit. Well, were they actually in coffins? Were they actually buried in coffins or were they just in, in the cemetery? No, these particular ones were in wooden coffins as described in the uh, Tulsa Race Riot Report mm -hmm. uh, where the city did uh, buy uh, uh, a numerous wooden coffins. They were supposed to be numbered. Um, we hadn't seen any numbers yet. Um, and so far as we know, they, you know, uh, we have yet to see the contents 
of the uh, uh, the coffins because uh, uh, that's why we suspended that particular time uh, so we can get a judge's order to do a full excavation of the site so we can have our research to be able when we pull them out they'll be immediately in the hands of the scientists so we can determine that these are in fact the Tulsa massacre victims because uh, it was also we were warned as a, uh, a as a commission that the bodies, whatever mass graves that we may come across, it might be those who had suffered during the pandemic of 1918, 1919. And so it, uh, uh, we wanted to make very, very sure that these folks uh, were not that of the pandemic, but those who actually died. Again, there was no documentation of where mm -hmm. these guys were. It took all history and technology to pinpoint exactly where they were. So is there a plan then, once the bodies are excavated, the scientists just have a plan on testing the bones or whatever is in the actual coffin to determine whether or not these uh, bodies or these souls died during the pandemic or that they died as a result of the massacre? They, is there a plan in place to ensure that all of those things take place, that the, that the documentation of the bodies, the DNA, whatever they, they need is, is going to be able to take place. One of the powers of the documentation uh, of the technology of today's time is that we have the power to, re uh, to, to have great detail, uh, the finer ethnicity of these folks, to find out if they were male or female. Um, we can find out if they did a, a died of trauma or a sickness. There's a lot of things that can be done. Even in the, the enamel of the tooth can hide or hold the DNA that, that we can extract from to help others to, uh, to see if they can identify with those who are on the grave. We already have one uh, family member that has come forth and said they had someone who was supposed to have been buried uh, there at Oakland, but they never knew exactly where or never got any information. So that one person came forth. And so uh, depending on the condition of the skeletal remains, we can greatly help us where we can find if they were uh, of that of traumatic death or that from the disease. Mm -hmm. And so we had that technology uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's, that, that's the biggest hope is to be able to extract the DNA and be able to connect DNA with other uh, family members in Tulsa or in the state of Oklahoma. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. That's, that's very helpful. Well, I have one more question for you. And mm -hmm. anyone else who has a question, please feel free to put it in the Q&A and I will uh, do my best to get to your question. But uh, the, the, the cemetery itself, was it originally, was it a, because I, I know back in the day, cemeteries were very segregated <laughs> as communities sometimes are. Uh, was it a considered a black cemetery? Was it considered a mixed cemetery? I'm curious as to that. You know, one of the one of the, the, the unique things found out when we were all uh, after the first um, first hot days in July, we had researchers and scientists all on site, and 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 so um, I knew the story of, of the cemetery that was passed down to me by other researchers that now passed away. Uh, and they were told me that the, the the land for the cemetery was donated by a black family, but I I, I never knew. And so one of the researchers uh, that had the the allotments uh, that the original allotments that was given uh, to the Black Creek Indians uh, uh, in that during that time period. And Michelle, when you brought brought this subject up, I, I you know I was like I lit up like a, a light bulb, and in, and instead it said, do you know? of a person named Centennial Manual. I said, Centennial Manual, I don't ring a bell. I said, who, who is Centennial Manual? Well, Centennial Manual uh, was the original owner that, that, that controls his allotment. And, and I said, and that's when I brought up the fact that I knew there was a black family that donated land. And then he came back and said, well, there's something kind of suspicious with this because this land was supposed to have been given to her she was just a child at the time. She was 17 and her brother was like 11. 
And they own a lot of property, including from Levin Street, Peoria, the freeway, all the way over to 6th Street. That, that was her family allotment. And then the next door neighbor, they had that allotment. That was the Bruner family. Well, that connects to my family. And, uh, and then found out that her little brother continued on the land over where Robert E. Lee School is located. And so uh, uh, the biggest question came in my mind when they expanded uh, the park over there, uh, 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 over there off of 6th Street, they called it Centennial Plaza. I'm like, wow, that's ironic. I wonder, did they name it at the Centennial Man, who's the original owner, or did they call it Centennial because we were celebrating the Centennial of Tulsa at that time? Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, that was amazing to me because I'm like, from my understanding, that it was illegal process for land to be given away or sold that of a child. It had to be of adult age. And so to see that like been sold for about a couple of hundred dollars, you know, and this family was like in Taft, Oklahoma. So when you said that earlier, Michelle, I like, bang, there it is. And so that was very interesting. And so, so this was a this was allotted to be the city's first cemetery. And so you have, but however, uh, talking to other researchers like Robert Littlejohn and Curtis Lawson uh, when they were alive, they said some of the first people who were buried in the cemetery were. Uh, uh, mixed creed uh, uh, Tulsans, uh, some uh, well known that was well established uh, in the community during that time. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but it, like most cemeteries around the United States, especially in the southern regions, it was segregated. Uh, where we found the bodies um, uh, were in the pauper's grave or in the colored section of uh, Oakland Cemetery. However, Clyde Eddy, who was 10 years old at the time, a white witness, uh, come forth. And he remembered as a child, 10 years old, being a scout, he would look into one of the crates and saw there were about four or five black men inside of a, a casket. And he went to two other caskets until they got ran out of there by the caretakers. But that, and where he remembered or where that, 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 that casket of uh, uh, the five bodies was in the white section. And so that's some of the discussion that we have right now as a committee to, uh, uh, to do further investigation in the Clyde Eddy spot before we go to anywhere else uh, in Tulsa. Uh, so we, we're planning to do more, uh, more work inside Oakland Cemetery. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. So Hannibal, Hannibal, who has written several books, who's on several commissions, uh, professor, I mean, all of your bios, it was hard to just narrow them down because you all have done such amazing work uh, in the community. I'm gonna ask you the same question that I asked Michelle and Kevin about how you got interested in doing this work. And then we'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the other issues that you're, that you're dealing with. I came to Tulsa in the mid 1980s to work for a law firm and I eventually got really plugged into community work. One of the things that I was asked to do was write a regular guest editorial column for the black newspaper called the Oklahoma Eagle. At one point I was asked to do a series on the Greenwood district in which the massacre occurred. I did that um, at the time knowing very little about this history, even though I grew up in Fort Smith, Arkansas, which is hundred miles Southeast of here. So I became really interested in telling the story from the vantage of a, a black man. That's really important because um, by the mid 1980s, there was a seminal book about the massacre called Death in a Promised Land by Professor or Dr. Scott Ellsworth. He's a professor at the University of Michigan, but he studied under the tutelage of Dr. John Franklin at, at, um, at Duke University, where he got his PhD. And um, the book is, is still the seminal book on the massacre itself, but that's what the book is about, the massacre. Mm -hmm. um, I am not interested in the massacre as a singular event. I am interested in Tulsa's historic Greenwood community, which means I'm interested in people and the dynamics between and among those people, which is a community. The massacre is an event that happens in that context. The massacre is also an event that happens within a national context 
of systemic structural institutional racism, as exemplified by, for example, the 1919 Red Summer, so-called race riots, and by lynchings, which proliferated throughout, throughout the early part of the 20th century. So I'm interested in a contextualized history of a people in the context of a community and how that history affects who and what we are today and how we live our lives. Right, so in, in, in just picking up on what you were just talking about in terms of this being an event that happened in Oklahoma and around the country during this time, there was the Red Summer, there were all of these other attacks that were happening uh, to black communities in particular that uh, were vibrant communities that had you know, all of the structures within a community because they worked within their community. You know, there was the black, there was a library for the black people, there were schools, there was, you know, the grocery store, there were, there were whole communities, the churches. Uh, seeing this as, as one context, this one event that happened, what is your view of other events that have happened around the country that may or may not be similar to what happened in, in Oklahoma, but structurally in terms of how systems were put in place, the structural racism was put in place around the United States. How do you put those other areas in context? And you can pick any, any one of these uh, other communities that have experienced the decimation of their uh, economic and social status. Historians and sociologists refer to the early part of the 20th century as the nadir of race relations in America. Nadir is a word that just means a low point. So conditions were um, decidedly anti-Black, particularly at the beginning of the 20th century through, through the mid 20th century. It plays out in a number of ways. It plays out in racial violence, racial trauma. It plays out in these so-called race riots, these massacres and assaults on Black communities all across the United States not a Tulsa specific phenomenon. In 1919, th these so-called race riots happened in New York and Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, DC, Omaha, Chicago, Elaine, Arkansas, Longview, Texas, all over the country. So, so the problem is, is a fundamental problem uh, around the, the sort of cardinal sin of, of racism that began with, with slavery and how it played out over time. Tulsa is important because Tulsa had a highly developed black economic and entrepreneurial community, Black Wall Street. And so its destruction obviously got great publicity throughout the nation because it was such a grand sort of model for black economic prowess and entrepreneurship. So it's important that we commemorate this history to remind ourselves about the battles that have been fought and, and, and again, as if we needed any reminder uh, to be tweaked about the battles that remain to be fought in terms of structural racism. Right, so one of the um, points in your book, the last word in your, in your latest book, Black Wall Street 100 and American City Grapples with Its Historical Racial Trauma. Trauma has been a theme that's come up from all three of you. And when we look at what's happening right now, in particular with the trial of the officer who uh, has killed George Floyd, one of the things that keeps coming up is that trauma that we continuously are faced with. How do you see the trauma and how do you cope with the trauma in your in your latest book for black communities of what they went through then and the trauma that we are dealing with right now in trying to just come to this racial reckoning or the, that communities are coming to this racial reckoning with. Because as a black person, I have been uh, acknowledged of my race for a very long time, but uh, some other communities may not be so. So talk a little bit about the trauma of, of past trauma and how it relates to trauma that we're experiencing today. You know, I think it, the, the formula is pretty simple for me. And, and, and that is to be black is to be by definition traumatized. 
I don't I don't know how you can be black and not be traumatized given the history that we've had. Um, you know, I grew up in Arkansas. My, par my parents were from rural Arkansas. I'm the youngest. I had older brothers and sisters who told me how, for example, um, cops would stop my dad on the highway and humiliate him in front of them and he could do absolutely nothing about it. Now, that that didn't happen to me, but but I, I experienced it vicariously through him, through the stories they told of, of him. I know of all the things that have happened in, in our history and, and what continues to happen. So it's important for me that we be able to connect the dots. The first step is acknowledging uh, who we've been over these many years. We have to own our history, understand how, we, how it has traumatized a lot of us and understand as best we can through empathy, what that trauma feels like and look like, looks like, and what we can do, not necessarily to eliminate the trauma. I don't believe in the term closure and all those sorts of uh, prettified uh, concepts that make it look like we can just check a box and move on, we can't. But there are things that we can do to make things better in the present, even though they're horrible in the past. And the, the first piece of that is the acknowledgement piece coming to grips with our full, rich history. Very much like the Tulsa Historical Society Museum wasn't always willing to elevate this part of our history, but that has changed over time. And so now they are a leading repository of photographs and information and traveling exhibits and so forth on this history. So we know that change is possible. And we know that what, what they're doing there at the Historic Society Museum, it makes a real difference in the lives of people in this community, particularly people in the white community, because that's a point of entry for people in the white community in, in, a, in a way that it hasn't always been, still is not fully uh, a point of entry for black people in this community. So that acknowledgement, uh, expressions of compassion and empathy apology, and then um, atonement. What is it about reparations that we need to be doing? Reparations simply meaning to make amends or to repair the damage from the past. We can do that in a number of ways through curricular changes, through education, through um, investments that are targeted to the black community. There are all manner of things that we can do by way of, of reparations. Uh, most of them involve money at some level, but they're not, they don't all involve cash payments to particular individuals. Um, cash outlays, almost anything you do requires some sort of cash outlay. So if you want to re reform the curriculum, that's going to require some sort of investment. Let's, let's use the term investment. If you want to build Greenwood Rising like we're doing now, that requires a substantial investment to, to build a facility that can teach people about this history and connect the dots with the present. We want to rekindle the Black Wall Street mindset, which is a thing for me, uh, which, which is to say, particularly with regard to African-American children, help them understand that they have historical role models who have been great successes in the economic sphere, in terms of entrepreneurship, and that they can do that right now. And that they are not physically limited to the space that is the Greenwood District, you know, what, what smart entrepreneur or business person wants to be unnecessarily constrained in a geographic area? You have the potential now for a global market. What really matters is what's between your ears, what you believe the possibilities are for you. And those possibilities were set, the bar was set really high by the icons of the Greenwood District back in the early 1900s and 1920s. So let me uh, ask you then, in terms of, because you brought up reparations, as that was going to be where I went to next. We've seen uh, in recent weeks, there have been a couple of communities that have offered reparations in the form of economic development kind of activities in form of cash payments, Oakland, uh, I think there was a community in Illinois. In terms of what happened after slavery when uh, 
owners of slaves were given some form of payment, right? Because they no longer now had slaves, right? And so they were, they were being given money by the government to basically pay for the fact that they would no longer have slavery. So that was a direct payment to, to those folks who were enslaving people. And, and, well, let, me have, just, let, me, let me stop you. It was, it was yeah. a direct payment for the loss of property. Right. The, those people who were enslaved, they weren't, they're, they're not, they're all, not even human. They're, we think that they're human, right, but right. they were not considered human. Right, they were right. three fifths a man and they were, they were property. And so they were being uh, compensated for losing their property. Right. And now we're at a, at a place where because of the fact that this event happened in Tulsa, there are communities, the community, um, some communities were able to build, some descendants not so much, and there have been uh, communities around the country that have had destruction done and have not been able to reap the benefit, the economic benefits, right? And so that's why there's uh, has been for many, many years this discussion about reparation and what it looks like. So some of the things that you talked about in terms of education and curriculum, so I'm curious as to the curriculum that's going on in Oklahoma and then further from Oklahoma so that we all learn about this history and we don't have to learn it when we become adults. So all of these things are very important. I'm just curious as to how the reparations um, uh, investment in communities is being done in Oklahoma, in Tulsa Greenwood specifically, to ensure that the people who were there during the time are able to reap the benefits of, well, right now we're in, you know, economic turmoil right now because of the pandemic, but prior to that and maybe hopefully subsequent to that, how are we going to be able to ensure that these communities are made as whole and full as they possibly can? Well, you know, my first thought is, and I don't want to be blunt, but it, we don't live in a just world. So all the things that, that should be happening as a moral matter are not, are not happening. They're not going to happen, unfortunately. So when we talk about reparations, I think we need to look at multiple fronts. We can do all these things simultaneously. They're not mutually exclusive. So some of the things are, are in fact being done, like investments in education, So Michelle, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Okay, so Hannibal's frozen here. We're, we've been having some technical difficulties, so hopefully Hannibal will, will pop back in. Um, but I wanted to ask you, Michelle, about oil specifically. Who was benefiting from the oil? Well, um, certainly when oil was discovered in uh, 1901 and then the largest oil field that we had in 1905, um, and we became the oil capital of the world because truly the largest field uh, was just a few miles from where I sit today. Um, that field in particular um, was drained pretty quickly. Uh, it was in the early 1900s, 1920s, 30s, and we didn't have all of the rules about spacing, et cetera, et cetera, that um, we now have. Um, there, uh, national oil companies in the 1920s moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma. We built these magnificent office buildings in the Art Deco style um, and beautiful homes, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, there were several busts, and really by the 1970s, Tulsa did not have the oil influence that it had. In fact, um, not as much of Oklahoma's economy, particularly in the eastern half of the state, is built on. We've had to diversify. Aviation, uh, medical are two of our really large um, uh, income drivers, if you will. So to say today, that people in Tulsa, Oklahoma are making a lot of money off oil would not be correct um, mm -hmm. at all. That's mm -hmm. sort of in our uh, rear view mirror. Houston um, is generally that center of the oil and gas industry. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, I just but at the time it was, it certainly 
was and and there was this idea of um i think it really was ego of wanting to prove to the rest of the world that we had class and we had culture and we had um the money to bring in the finest artisans and architects and build this community in a nowhere place in the middle of the united states that we were not chicago atlanta um Manhattan by any means or even West Coast. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So it's sort of that little men syndrome that we had for a long time wanting to prove <laughs> to the rest of the world. That, that you're somebody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I just put in the chat um, for all of you that I, um, Hannibal's book can be bought, of course, on Amazon, but also there's a local bookstore there in Oklahoma. And um, for those of you who may not know a, a lot about this, not to say that you'll learn a lot from these two uh, cultural programs, but HBO Watchmen talked about uh, the Tulsa massacre. That was uh, one of the first scenes was, was of, the, of the massacre that day. And uh, Lovecraft Country actually also had a very touching session on, um, on, on the massacre itself because the characters, a few of the characters had come from Oklahoma. So I just wanted to put that in the box. And I think we have Hannibal back. Hannibal, you were mid-sentence and we lost you. So yeah, you let are, me, you're back. Yeah, we, we, there's a windstorm. I, I'm confident that's what it is. I live in a high-rise condo tower. And I'm sure the wind is affecting the, the receptivity. Yeah. But anyway, I was saying that Tulsa Public Schools is really engaged in a robust effort to infuse this history into the curriculum. So they're working to put put the history in grades K through 12 in curriculum materials, not just in Oklahoma history, United States history, but in various disciplines in which it, it can fit. It fits into social studies and economics and, and, and all sorts of various uh, disciplines, psychology um, and so forth. Um, that's a process and, and you know we'll continue to work on that. We're working with the State Department of Education to see if we can't get some questions about this history on state mandated exams so that teachers have yet another incentive to, incentive to teach the history. Again, curriculum form is a form of reparations, building uh, facilities that are teaching facilities like museums. John F. Franklin Park, John F. Franklin Reconciliation Park it, it, it is a reparation item really. I mean, it's a space for the community to come together and reflect on this history um, and come together and, and, and dialogue, host events, and et cetera. Gathering Place, the largest public park public private pr partnership in the nation built at a cost of about $360 million. Part of the impetus for the Gathering Place is to bring people together across the, the divides that would otherwise separate us. All these are, are forms of reparation, as are the potential of, of cash payments to identified individuals. Problem with the cash payments route is that uh, it has to it has to go through an institutional process that, by definition, is going to be resistant to that, and that's why the lawsuit in 2003 it was concluded that that lawsuit was time barred by the statute of limitations. There's a lawsuit now that's pending seeking reparations, but it's based on a different kind of theory, a nuisance theory. It's a really novel theory. Um, my guess is that it's not going to be successful because, again, we're going through an institutional process and the institution is going to be resistant to opening the floodgates to these claims that are claims that will come from all over the nation, from, from decades and decades of history. Um, it's, I don't think it's realistic to assume that that's going to happen. The kinds of reparations that people talk about regularly that have actually happened reparations to people of Japanese descent who are descendants are, or, or are the people who were interned during World War II. Those are things that, were, that came out of the legislative process, not the judicial process, not the adversarial court process, the legislative process. Reparations for Rosewood survivors, 1923 event. Those reparations were accorded by the Florida legislature, not through the courts. So do you anticipate legislative motions being made in, in the Oklahoma legislature. Is there any all, can, talking about- Yeah, talking make, about all, make all the motions you want in the Oklahoma <laughs> legislature up today. They're not gonna go anywhere. 
uh, we, we have a really, really, really conservative legislature. And I, did, I which is not to say that that couldn't happen at some point in history. It's not going to happen in the, near, in the near term. Well, the fight for reparations, of course, has been going on for years, years and years and years. And um, I think in probably within the past two, three years, there's been a lot more discussion on the national level about right. reparations. And so uh, it, it's but, possible. I mean, yeah. I understand what you're saying, yeah. definitely, that it's, it's a conservative. possible at the, at, the, at the national level. The national level is not like the Oklahoma level. Oklahoma right. in two Every successive- Every state is different. <laughs> Oklahoma in two successive election, elections, maybe three, every county voted for the Republican presidential candidate. Every county. Um, so that, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, it's not to say that we shouldn't be having the dialogue. We absolutely ought to have the dialogue. Um, but I think we can't pin all our hopes on getting something done through the legislative or judicial processes. We have to do the things that we can do with the resources that we have right now and then work on other things. Yeah, right. and I would add in the Oklahoma legislature, you have to go back to history and understand that true divide between Western Oklahoma, who doesn't care a thing about Eastern Oklahoma and vice versa, you know, to some extent. And then you also have a great divide um, between rural and urban. <laughs> That not only do we have Oklahoma City and Tulsa who don't always see eye to eye and are very different communities, but then it's that rural um, um, urban divide and there are just other priorities. And I think Hannibal stated it very well um, that uh, not in the near future. Um, do you yeah. have a sense that there are uh, so many and I'm just going to say, be blunt, white people who, who see the idea of reparations as we're giving these people who, um, these Black people I, you know, money or, yeah, you know, yeah, and they're not yeah. working I for, think you say reparations and white people grab for their wallets. Because they think that it's, it's, it's going to cost them money. It's cost yeah, them. yeah. And then, you know, the, tri the old arguments of I didn't live here. I wasn't alive. I didn't live here. My family didn't live here. Right. I wasn't I had to pay, and, right. et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, right. but Michelle, that, that's precisely why when we talk about reparations, we shouldn't artificially constrain the definition of reparations to cash payments to particular individuals. I when agree. Talk, Absolutely. Talk to people about the broader yeah. concept of reparations. Yeah. Uh, many more people are willing to entertain the notion that, yes, we should build this facility so we can teach about this history, it's important. Yeah. Yes, we ought to do that. Yes, we should build John F. Franklin Park. Yes, we should change the curriculum. Yes, we should provide ancillary resources for teachers. Yeah. But no, we should not give you know, Kevin money from me because he had an ancestor that was unfortunately yeah. around in 1921 and was harmed. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I, and my point is just that daily that's the attitude that I encounter. And I feel that my job and what I am called to do is to present that point of view of which Hannibal just described. And I think it's also important um, that in, from my white seat of privilege that I don't go in there wagging my little finger saying, this is what reparation should look like this is what you need, that when I go into um, the Greenwood district and building these relationships, I go there to listen and to learn. Um, and um, I'm, I'm very intentional about that process. Okay, I wanna uh, know, definitely let people right. know, just one second, Kevin, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. And I have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, that folks have sent to me directly. So I will I will go over those. But Kevin, please go right ahead. Um, uh, reparations, for the most part, I, I strongly believe that, and, and, and Hannibal, you said it correctly. Uh, we look at the root word of reparation that means to repair. Um, I, I'm a belief that even what we're doing right now with the mass grave situation, that is a form of reparation. Mm -hmm. That is a form of, of repairing, to do good, to right a wrong. 
you know. And when you talk about cash, I'm, you know, being the descendant, I'm like, uh, I'm not thrown out with the idea about cash, cash uh, uh, funding. But at the same time, I'm looking at, we got to have a discussion all ourselves to figure out what does cash uh, 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 reparations look like, you know? Um, you know, I hope people don't think that it's a, it's a situation where you go out and you can just shop <clears throat> until you drop kind of funding. Um, I think strongly if it would have happened the way that it was designed by the uh, Race Right Commission report, those five recommendations, I think we will have been in a totally different light uh, today where you had uh, uh, cash payments towards the, the ride survivors that we were living at the time cash payments to the descendants of those survivors. Uh, those making uh, ta uh, the North Tulsa area uh, a part of a business empowerment zone uh, to give scholarship, what we're just not doing now uh, through the education uh, uh, department here in the state of Oklahoma uh, uh, to let these kids know about what happened from elementary all the way up to college. You know, that's good. I wish it would have happened when those recommendations uh, uh, came to light so many years ago. And of course, the John Hall Franklin Park, which you know received that $5 million, were well, less than $5 million. I didn't get all that money. Uh, but um, I wish that at least they, uh, the city and the state would have met those recommendations some kind of way other than taking the easy one, which I was there when the commissioners were arguing on the level or the order on how the recommendation should follow. And, and reparations was right at the top. And, and the memorial was the last at the bottom. So what was done was the memorial first, and then we'll get to the rest. And, you know, uh, I wish we would have uh, did more efforts to address those issues long time ago, or we wouldn't be having the discussion right now. And if you notice, whatever, and you correct uh, uh, Hannibal, uh, uh, Florida, the Rosewood went through a legislation movement on that. The same thing uh, that Tulsa was trying to reflect from what was done in Rosewood. But you won't hear nothing from the folks uh, uh, about reparations in Florida because they went on and paid that money. And so I, I'm of a different cut um, that, that what should have been done. It, it should have been done sooner than later. And, and until it is done correctly, until the right is wrong, we're going to always have this argument of what reparations look like and I on think the national that, front and even on the Oklahoma front. Well, and definitely when you're talking about the national front, um, the term reparations, as you say, you know, to repair, but I don't know that contextually it has been given to communities about what it could potentially encompass, right? And so you talk about the park as a part of reparations. Is that how it was laid out to the community that this is a form of a reparation? Because when no. people hear reparation, they think the, mo the money, right? They think the monetary aspect of it. But if the connotation is reparation equals cash payments, and there is not a discussion about all of the levels of reparation that could potentially exist, then yes, but that is, I mean, that happened years ago when we started talking about reparation, but that's, you know, the connotation that people have is that it's a, a cash payment. Um, and that it wasn't all of these other structural things that Hannibal, you know, talked about the educational pieces. Um, so I was just, I'm just curious. I'm just throwing that out there. You well, know, in terms of Greenwood. That $5 million that was allotted for the John Hope Franklin Park was the equivalent of the $5 million that seed money for the Oklahoma City bombing. And so that that wasn't, you know, so uh, in the context of reparations, no, it was like, if you're going to uh, 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 give money towards uh, one tragedy, then you give the same amount of money for uh, the other tragedy as well. And so that was an easy fix on part of, of the uh, on part of the legislature, and plus the, the constitution is is so messed up as you know, Hannibal. As far as the state of Oklahoma is not going to sue itself, and it's not, you know unless you like a, a vendor or some type, they're not going to do uh, uh, cash payments to individuals. And so 
into that legislation until them constitutions are changed, which is not going to happen anytime soon. You know, we will always have the discussion about reparation on what happened in 1921. So let me ask uh, any of you can answer this and then uh, Hannibal, I want to come back to you and talk a little bit more about your latest book, but uh, the Tulsa Race Riot uh, Reconciliation Act was to provide uh, college scholarships to descendants. Is that happened? Has, does it, has it happened? Is it planning? Like, do we, any of you know anything about that? Yeah, it, it, did, it did happen immediately after the act passed. It was, the scholarships were provided. They weren't for descendants of massacre victims. The scholarships were not limited. There was, I believe there were two scholarships from, from each of the public high schools in, in Tulsa. Uh, I, don't, I can't remember what they were, maybe $1,000 each. Um, yeah. I don't know what the status of that is now, but it was it was begun and it went for several years, not tied specifically to um, familial relations with someone who was a survivor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Anna, well, could you talk a little bit about more what's what's in your your new book other than than the trauma? Like, what else? Other how does it differ than some of your other books that you? It's very. I think it's very simple and straightforward. So I'll, I'll be succinct. The, the whole point of the book is, is to answer the question that will be on the, the minds, lips, and in the hearts of people when they just rediscover Tulsa this year in, in connection with the centennial. And that is, what is different about the Tulsa of 2021 as compared to the Tulsa of 1921? We've had 100 years to, to do things. What have we done? What have we left undone? That's the whole point of the book. We had a traumatic event. Uh, we're a hundred years removed from that traumatic event. What's different? What needs to be done? Where are we? Okay, thank you. So final comments, if any of you want to say anything about where we go forward, how does the broader community uh, help Tulsa? Like, what is it that we can do? Like, we want it to be there, of course. <laughs> this year to, um, to I, I've never been to Oklahoma. And so I was looking forward to coming. And so I guess maybe maybe next year we'll be able to travel. I don't know, I hope to be able to, to come there. So what can the broader do, community do to learn more or do more to, to help you? And I'll start with Michelle. Uh, thank you. Well, um, I hope that you'll come see us um, and your um, uh, watchers too. Um, that you'll come to Tulsa and experience um, the Greenwood District. Although it today, it is a small area uh, with only a few businesses, but we have big dreams of what it can be. But again, since I'm a historian, I tend to look back. And so I was just in the Greenwood District yesterday, standing at, right at Greenwood and Archer, and as you look at the plaques that are reverently placed in the sidewalks describing the businesses that were there, that were destroyed. And for me, I, my imagination goes to what Greenwood looked like, this, the sounds, um, the joy, the laughter, the, um, I just try to imagine what Greenwood was in its heyday. So I, I think those ghosts, if you will, um, still walk those streets if you're open to hear them um, and to see a people who not only built Greenwood the first time, but built it the second time. And for me, that's an idea of dreaming what can be. Thank you, thank you. Kevin? You know, Michelle, we must be on the same wavelength because I too was at Corner Greenwood and Arch yesterday looking at those plaques. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, um, please come uh, to Tulsa. If not this year, come next year. Uh, I've never seen my city so vibrant in the preparation uh, for 21 that it's not just going to be just it's so-called celebration, it's a commemoration and not forgetting. Uh, I'm always saying things like, you know, let's do things to right the wrong. We should have did a long time ago, but 
one thing I love that's going on, and I, the young folk are getting it, the, the little kids are, are getting it, is that the spirit of a city that once was destroyed and came back, and when it was destroyed again, came back. And that feeling, I'm, I think there's a lot of people, once they put their foot on these grounds here, on Greenwood and walk the area, uh, you couldn't help but to feel the vibration that's here. You know, I, I, every once in a while, at least once a week, I got to go down on Greenwood, you know, and feel that ground vibration. Uh, and I'm quite sure um, that others will feel that. I remember going uh, about a couple of years ago, going to Kent University, um, where they were celebrating or commemorating uh, May 4th, 1970. It was the 49th uh, commemoration of that incident where the National Guard had, had uh, uh, shot and killed numerous uh, students there, but each year they commemorated the year like it was homecoming. 300 people will come back and they will take this historic walk through the university at, at midnight and, and by candlelight and stand uh, on a spot where people had lost their lives. And they stayed in this spot until the sun came up. It was a very powerful and moving experience. And I'm hoping that something similar here can happen here in Tulsa because uh, if I can feel a vibration many hundred miles away and I can feel that same kind of vibration here in Tulsa, I'm quite sure others will feel the same way. And then that's something uh, I'm glad that my city is really putting the best foot forward and I hope that it's sustained because I'm willing, I'm really ready to see what 22 is going to be looking like. Uh, uh, do, do we run out of ammunition? Do we run out of energy from doing all the stuff we did in 21? Uh, you know, what are some things that would be sustained? And so I'm quite sure we're on a, such a, a momentum of interest worldwide. Um, I, I, I can't wait to your group to come to Tulsa uh, I'm 21. Look every, all beyond. of you up, you know, uh, there's got to be a meal out of this somewhere. In we would oh, be yeah, offended. Would. <laughs> we would be offended if you come to town and we don't know it. No, no, no. I, yeah. all of you will know. Yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll go, go to Wanda J's. <laughs> Wanda yeah. J's. Okay, I'm gonna write that down. Trust there will be no sneaking into the <laughs> into Tulsa. <laughs> Annabelle, you have the last word. Of course, I have a book to hawk. So <laughs> yes, I want, of people, course. <laughs> I want people to, to read the book. Uh, <laughs> I understand, <laughs> Angela, that you. Made, you made a call to my publisher and ordered a thousand copies last <laughs> night. So I, a thousand I really and thank, one. I thank you for that. A thousand and one. <laughs> um, the other thing, I think there's something for everybody. I, I want to mention something that's unique just, just because I think it's really clever and unique and will get a lot of publicity as well. There's a group of uh, local hip hop artists who have done an album that will debut in connection with, with the centennial. Uh, and they have, they just signed an agreement with Motown Records to release the album called Fire in Little Africa. It's mostly spoken word. Um, it's just an incredible project. Fire um, Art, Little Africa? Fire in Little Africa. Little Fire. Africa is what Greenwood community was called. Okay. De denigrated as by some people in the white community at, at some points in our history. Uh -huh. The other thing that's interesting about this is that uh, part of the production of the album was done at uh, Skyline Mansion, which was, used to be owned by Tate Brady, one of the founding fathers, a Klansman who, who purportedly had a role in, in the massacre. The mansion is now owned by Felix Jones, a former black NFL uh, star. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just the ironies that are all <laughs> wrapped up in all of that are incredible. That is, that is pretty incredible. So what is, what's happening at the mansion? He he uses it for events. I, I think I think I think they may have recorded some segments of the of the piece yes. there, but they did other segments in the Grimble community. Okay, all right. I'll make sure that everyone. Um, of course, I'd love for Hannibal to always have the last word, but I know that um, the three of us who are on today have been doing lots of national media, um, and so I would encourage your listeners to um, sort of watch what's going to be on major networks. They're all doing multi-part um, series. And um, Hannibal and I have several interviews, joint interviews scheduled next week and all. So for me, that's um, 
it is such a great opportunity for us to tell the story beyond our community. Right. Um, and uh, well, so grateful for those opportunities. And read Hannibal's send, book. Yes, read yeah. Hannibal's book. And anything you want to send to us, I'll make sure that we send it out okay. to our to our network and this, yeah. uh, in particular the folks who did who did join and who registered for this today. So I had one more question. Um, during the riot, there was a publication, it was a newspaper, and it was the Tulsa Tribune. Are they, did they apologize for some no. of the work? No, and they're still around. No. Okay. Okay. I thought I heard something about there was an apology that came, but maybe not. Maybe there there was been a, a, maybe another was a paper. Bad editorial is what it was. Right. And there have been, a, been apologies, but not from the Tulsa Tribune. Yeah. Okay. No. Well, and, and the, it, it, the it, it, Tribune it closed. Problem. The Tribune closed in '97. Okay. So that was even before the um, the commission report right, that right. Kevin's father had played such a role in. Mm -hmm. The Tribune had closed by that okay. time, or about that time. Yeah. Okay. And it was another paper in another city that apologized for something related to race. <laughs> I don't remember. There, yeah, there, there's been such a racial reckoning after yeah. uh, George Floyd's killing last year. There was exactly. all of this. There were so many things that were happening um, that I may just be mixing stories. So there, there was a paper who did do a recent apology for its racist past. I can't remember which paper it was. Oh, it's it a major like daily. A, yeah, I thought it's maybe, a major daily. I thought it was Oklahoma, but maybe it was someplace in the Midwest. No, it was not in Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, th thank you. No. <laughs> thank you for not that. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> not okay. yet. Ever the optimist, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all again so much. This has been such a great conversation. I really, really appreciate you taking the time. I know that this is a very busy time and busy year. I wanted to get in early because I know that there's going to be a lot happening May, June. So thank you all for agreeing to participate. We really, really, really do appreciate it. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you for having Come me. see us. I will. Quick. Yeah.